welcome to edition 53 of All Killer No Filler Podcast with me, Rachel Fairburn and Kira pritchard McLean. Just before we start, we'll do our usual disclaimer. This isn't hero worship. We do this podcast because we have a mutual interest in serial killers. And as long as we are doing this podcast, it stops us from writing to them in prison. <laughs> yeah, why am I laughing? <laughs> Because we've been recording this podcast for half an hour and I've just realised it hasn't been recording. Um, so, yeah, we're going to fucking... And, I'm, and I'm in a cracking mood today, so it doesn't... I'm just like, whatever, way. <laughs> yeah, episode 53. We must apologise, it is a bit late, but we've been mega busy. In fact, we got up very early to record this today, didn't we? 6.30am. Coming from different sides of the country to meet in the greatest city on earth. Sorry if there's a bit, it's a shittle. So if there's a bit of background noise, it's because um, we're, yeah, we're in the London flat and uh, there's some train noise, so apologies for that. Atmosphere. I'm absolutely it. fuming if you haven't already <laughs> gathered that I have just wasted that much uh, time of our lives. It's fine, it's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll crack on. So we were going to do the Kimberly Killer. Yes. However, a couple of issues. One, there was hardly anything about his background, apart from the fact that he was German and he used to be a security guard. Secondly, technically a spree. And you know what, I'm like a stickler for the rules. We've done a few, we've let a few sprees we, in, we have, I'm not yeah. happy about it. But there was just a lack of information, so we, we didn't want to, we didn't want to feel like we were putting something out that wasn't, what's the word? Bumper. <laughs> what? I don't know. Um, you, she's waving a hand in the air above <laughs> her head, and I don't know what that's meant to mean. <laughs> Substantial. Substantial. But you have a bumper. <laughs> what, are you a fucking child? Bumper. Are you a sticker book, mate? I love, the, I love the word bumper. I love the word jumbo. I just don't think jumbo <laughs> is used. Jumbo sausage. Oh, my God, I fucking love a jumbo sausage. Jum- jumbo marker. Jumbo marker. Jumbo dib-dab. Yeah, I just don't think it's used. Wait, enough. sorry, not dib-dab. Dabber. Dabber. Uh, jumbo jet. All okay. the jumbos. All the jumbos. So, who would... Dumbo's who, cousin. <laughs> <laughs> so who are we going to do? We're going to do Burke and Hare. Which I absolutely love. I think it is uh, Scorcio as um, as serial killers go. I think it's fucking fascinating. And we did it when we were in America as well. And we did it in for one of the... Uh, Edinburgh. Edinburgh. So, I mean, there's going to be a couple of... Well, quite a lot of you, actually. Who've, I'd say about a thousand of you who've already heard about this. Um, but people have actually asked us to record it as well. Yes, that's true. So... Something for everyone. Yes, and obviously we won't tell you all the showbiz gossip that we told you in the rooms <laughs> when we did it live. Then we've got to stop doing that now. I think they're getting too Sorry, big. Sorry, who, who's got to stop doing that? You. You're an absolute cunt, you know that. <laughs> You're an absolute dick. Hey, listen, words can't hurt me today. <laughs> right. Christine Aguilar. Well, what, I, sometimes I, I, when I'm in a really good mood, there's no in-between, is that I'm either... Ugh. Or I'm like... Way. Yeah, I mean, you're diagnosing yourself. Right <laughs> I, now. Actually, I think yeah. I am. So you think I'm like either I... really low or I'm really sort of manic and high. I, I wish there was a word for that. See, I, I can't win with my mum, you see, because she's like, you, you're constantly cynical. And then when I'm in a really good mood, she's like, you're unbearable. <laughs> like, you just went, there's no, you can't. Sort of pull you back. So you can't moderate. So it's it's not, it's like it's a uh, it's like glass overflowing or glass empty. Yeah. Not not half there's no, half empty. There's no sort of middle ground. <laughs> but I'm so sure someone will fuck me off and it'll be ruined. Anyway. Anyway, Burke and Hare. Um, <laughs> she's so, back. <laughs> <laughs> she. This takes place in the city of Edinburgh, where we go and um, lose thousands of pounds every August. Yep. Um, God, that system's rigged, but we don't have time for that. So, yeah, it takes place in Edinburgh, and how the city has chosen to commemorate <laughs> the pair of serial killers is they've named a strip club after um, the pair of them. It's called the Burke and Hare, <laughs> and it's near the uh, grass market where a lot of this takes place. There's three um, strip bars that are close to each other in an area of town that is colloquially known as the Pubic Triangle, which I think is fucking <laughs> top-notch. Um, Lovely. Now, one of my favourite things to do is to go on the um, Google reviews of strip bars and swingers bars. Um, and the Bergen Hair has got some absolute belters. So these are all, I'm not even selecting, these are all just next to each other, right? Two stars, this is from Nathan. He says, lame, lame, <laughs> cheap chicks in cheaper lingerie, except for one pro. 
No Charlie. All right, mate. Oh, no. Nathan's a cunt. Yeah, he is, isn't he? Has he left his number on there? I might give him a ring. <laughs> Sounds right on my show. He's reviewed loads of other stuff. Let me just have a quick, quick <laughs> look, click on Nathan and see what else he's reviewed. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, he, yeah, he is literally just uh, brilliant. He's reviewed a little. Yes, it's a little. A bit more expensive than the Kirkgate branch, though. <laughs> Scott Med will take a huge hit, in my opinion. Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> Oh my god! And then he said, "Oh my god, this guy's amazing." He's reviewed uh, somewhere in Edinburgh. Uh, hairdressers, time to retire. The guy does more talking about his past salons than cutting. Maybe he was good back in the day, but the hair got I got today was rank. Also, ten pound for a standard back and sides joke. Uh, I don't like this guy. He's an absolute. Has he got a picture of him? Oh my god. Used, uh, this is about a barber. God, he constantly... He's got no fucking loyalty. About eight of these are barbers. Used to be good. News guys and a new scab on my head. <laughs> Was a regular, but now no more. I think Shame, it's the badness really. coming out of you, Nathan. Good God. Brilliant. Textile. He's, um... What? My phone. You've got a new phone? Yeah. Ah, oh, nice. Thanks. CEX. Top notch banter, this isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, but I'm really, um, I, I just, I'm obsessed with this guy and what he's. Um, I think we should get Nathan on at the live show. He's, he's complained about a, a hotel. Nice, too many coaches outside though. Fuck it. Oh hell. god. <laughs> Doesn't like a, a crocodile cove in Australia, but that seems fair. What a nutter. Yeah, he is. The other review. He's though. so personal. Station manager on drugs. <laughs> Overworked and understaffed city centre doctor's office. God, what is this? He fucking hates Did he have to go there because he had a scab on his head? Yeah. <laughs> um, do you remember we were on the plane on the way to back from America? I was so tired and I was trying to do those crosswords on the thing. <laughs> and the clue was someone who crosses a picket line and I wrote scum and you went, do you mean scab? I was like, yes. <laughs> same thing, innit? <laughs> yeah. I think I said that. I was like, same thing. <laughs> So uh, so that was Nathan. Anyway, so James says, five stars for Bergen Hair. What a great experienced night. Now, I think it's a typo, but it might also be a creepy reflection of um, the women and how capable they are. Um, okay, this is Nick Carter. Not that one, but who knows. <laughs> he gave it five stars. Two-line um, review, which starts with this. Best place I've ever been. Strong start. Ever. Second line. <laughs> Why is that, Nick? Let you touch them. Oh. Stop being a creep, Nick. <laughs> um, and then this is my favourite one. This is by Peter L. Deegan, um, which reminds me of <laughs> when Will got introduced on stage as uh, Philip Dugan. That was after spending the entire day with the guy that introduced really? him. Really? So, yeah. uh, so your friend of the show, Will Duggan, was like, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Philip Dugan. No, do you know who I think that was? Is I think that was... Yeah, he spent the entire day with him. Mind you, this is a Will story. This is a touch of the fin- 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 about salt, that. yeah. Do you all know what Doug... Have we told them what Dugganing is? Well, I don't think we've Oh, told yeah, them. no, we have. We told them what well, Dugganing is when you pass off a story of someone else's life as your own. But it's um, just... Will lies a lot, doesn't he? Oh, we don't have to tell some fibs. I mean, I love him to bits. And yeah. he's a little angel. He's great. But he's a bloody fibber. Yeah. I don't know if we should tell this story. I was really fed up the other day. I don't know what was wrong with me. I was having one of my lows. <laughs> and I was uh, talking to him. And I was like, oh, Will, when are things going to get better? And he said, you think you've got fucking problems? I have just had to go into the toilets at King's Cross St Pancras and stick my finger up my own anus because I have hemorrhoids. What? <laughs> I think I need to cut this out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why has he got hemorrhoids? And why is he putting his finger up his ass? How will that help? I think he has to put anus all up. Yeah. That very same day, actually, I was on my way to St Albans uh, to do a gig, and a, a very lovely lady came up to me in uh, the AMT cafe. You know those horrible little things in a train station? <laughs> like in a very, very depressing it was. And she said, oh, hello, uh, are you Rachel? I said, yes, and I thought I was going to be arrested because I'm paranoid. And she said, uh, oh, I love the podcast. My friend doesn't believe that I'm in the same restaurant as you. And I said, come on, mate, this is not a restaurant. <laughs> And she took a picture of us for Snapchat to show her friend. Who? Who? A police officer? No, no, it was a lovely woman. Oh. It's a nice woman. But I'm, I'm so paranoid, mate, that if someone asks my name, the first thing I think is, I'm going to get arrested. <laughs> Even though I've done nothing wrong. <laughs> I'll have to cut that story out about Will. What were we on about? Uh, I was reading you the last review. Oh, yeah, the last which review. Which is from Peter L. Deegan. 
so he's given it two stars and he says, came there in 1945. Now he's not put a dot, <laughs> so it does look like he came there to celebrate the end of the Second World War. No stockings, just gravy browning. <laughs> <laughs> Lit creosote sort of a woman's leg. Came there in 1945 to order sandwich to be rudely told that the kitchen wasn't open. Well, don't go to a strip club for a sandwich, mate. <laughs> we were saying this when we were in America. We were like, who's eating in strip clubs? Why would you eat in there? And uh, apparently it's, it's a big thing in America. It's the steaks that people go for, isn't it? Yeah, and like casinos as well. So that was us. With egg on our faces, let me tell you. Yeah, apparently loads of people are like, oh, this place does the best like loaded fries. I saw a, um advert when I was going to Las Vegas. I might have mentioned this before. When I was going to Las Vegas a few years ago with my favourite ex-boyfriend, and uh, there was a big billboard as you went in to Las Vegas, and it said, it had a fork with a bit of steak on it, and it said, uh, here's a great piece of meat. And then the next billboard <laughs> was a woman in uh, a very scanty sort of underwear, and it said, and here's another one, and it was for a strip club. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I did laugh. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, to be honest, anyone who's going probably to spend money there, that's right up their alley, isn't it? Yeah. That kind of humour. Um, Will Duggan's frequented uh, strip clubs quite a lot, hasn't he? <laughs> he's going to go mad at us saying frequented. <laughs> he's going to go, he's going to lose his shit about this. He's been in a few, yeah. Well, yeah, because yeah, he's a man of the world, isn't he? Yeah. And uh, he was telling us about, well, he thinks that he can recognise someone who's a stripper from their smell. He says they have a very Fear. distinct smell. <laughs> <laughs> it's when he walks in. <laughs> Hot panic. <laughs> he says it's because they work really hard and it's really physical. Um, just you fucking dancing for like however many hours. He says that they, a lot of them wear lots of talc um, to kind of, I don't know, keep themselves... Get themselves in and out of outfits. Get themselves yeah, in the bar. That's... Is that a thing? Yes, maybe. Get yeah. slippy on the bar. And uh, and he says just like kind of cheap perfume. Not as in like, oh, you smell cheap, but like obviously like I can get loads of this for a five from Home Bargain. So he's like, that's the smell of them. Yeah, you're not going to waste your good stuff on. No, you're not. Yeah, yeah. you're not going to rub Chanel number no. five <laughs> over some business. You know what? I don't even know what they're like. Technically, in there, so you are at work. Different. You don't wear your best stuff for work. No, do you fuck? Absolutely not. Not even when you do stand up. No. We do for the live shows. Yeah, that's true. We really make an effort for that. I was thinking I need to buy something for that. Anyway, um, and he was saying that, yeah, sometimes the talc sort of, like, gathers, like, under their armpit and stuff and in, like, you know, like, corners because they, they've got so much of it on. And then I uh, I asked him if it... <laughs> uh, if it... If it gathers around the corner of their fannies, like, you know, when you talk too much and you get white bits in the corner of your mouth. <laughs> if their fannies look like that. And then he, he didn't want to talk anymore. As if Will's ever been near... I think he has. I think he has had it. Well, like our mate Ed, who's like classic kind of sweet beta male, is has has had a dance. Yeah, but the strip <clears throat> the strippers not 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 sex workers. You not you don't get to see the you don't get to see everything, do you? Yeah, I'm pretty yeah. sure they get their fannies out. Oh, isn't it? The whole point is they dance and it's naked. No, not not always. Not always. If if you are if you do work in a a strip club, let us know. Well, is it not different? So some of them you'll pay for it. So like Ed had a dance, and I think that's why she was taking her clothes off and dancing because she apparently I was like, oh, is it sexy? And he's like, not really. I was just chatting to her at the bar because like some of his mates are in there. And then she was like, oh, do you want to dance? And he's like, I just didn't feel like I could say no. And then you get into this little booth, and she pulls the curtain across and goes, right, sit on your hands. <laughs> so it's like okay, and it, what, in case you start furiously masturbating, and it's like no, it's in case you grab them. Um, and then, uh, and then she did a dance, and it just looked sort of kind of really sad all the way through, and sort of <sighs> huffing and rolling her eyes. And then she sort of swished her hair seductively, and a necklace fell to the floor. And he picked it up, and uh, uh, she picked it up really quickly and put it on the side. And then at the end, he was like, "Oh, well, that was quite nice actually." And was like, "Oh, thank you very much." And he's like, "I'm sorry about your necklace." She's like, "Yeah, my granddad gave me that just before he died." And he's like, "Oh, oh. see you, bye bye, <laughs> to my boner forever." <laughs> But yeah, I think that they do take their clothes off. Uh, I don't know. I think some maybe. I think some do, and so I don't know. I don't know. Please let us know. Very ignorant. Maybe we should go. There we should. We should have a staff out in. I uh, I tried to. Where was I with um, a friend of mine, female friend of mine? We were drinking in London. And we're like, you know what it's like in London. Bloody everything's shut at five past ten at night. Yeah, can't get a drink. Yeah, like, I was just going, and they wouldn't let us in the strip club because we were women. We're women. <laughs> And I was like, 
I just want to have a drink. Can I, why can't I come in? They won't let us in. <laughs> really? <laughs> they were like ten pound each, and we're like, yeah, we'll pay it. And then they were like, no. And like, we weren't pissed, pissed, but they just didn't want to let us in because we were women. That's weird, isn't it? Yeah. Do you think it's because men would be more self-conscious about how they act if w- women walked in? Possibly, but I mean, this was or they about... would try and fuck you instead of. This was about four years ago, and I, I, I think with sort of how things have changed now, I doubt they'd be able to like say you can't come in because you're a woman. Yeah. You could probably you could probably have them for something there. We. Oui. Yeah. So yeah. I don't want to go to a strip club. Oh, fucking I mean, having said that, I can't imagine anything worse than a man. <laughs> Sexy dancing. On oh it. god, yeah. You know when people have it for like. <laughs> Uh, Hindus and stuff I'm like I it seems awful yeah or like Magic Mike and stuff like that I'm like it's not for me yeah I think it's just a bit embarrassing isn't it it is yeah yeah not not my bag at all no no it's not for me Oof. there's only one dancing actually it's, she's just started dancing <laughs> I must have told this one that when my friend said to me I was watching something that was like sexy dancing <laughs> and I went oh shall I do some sexy dancing and as I went like that both my arms cracked <laughs> I was like, all right, I'll do that again. You that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen you dance. I've seen you moonwalk. You look like you're a... Because we learned that when, when you're in America, we learned that you can't slut drop. Oh, this... You just can't do it. There's something wrong with your legs. Yeah, but I thought I, I, I could. It was Edinburgh that this news was broken to me after I had a night out with Anna, our uh, tour manager, would you say? Producer. Producer. Yeah. Anna, our, our producer. Promoter. Promoter for the live shows. I got absolutely hammered. And uh, with some male friends of ours, and I was joking... And I was like, well, there's a slut drop. And they were just looked at me like, the fuck is that? Yeah, it's very upsetting. And you know in your mind when you go, this is either really good or really bad. <laughs> it was really bad. <laughs> it's so I'll strange. show you at the live show. You so look like someone who would be able to dance as well. But I've seen you moonwalk. You look like you're breaking in two new hips. <laughs> Fresh in. <laughs> just letting them settle down. I, I, genuinely, I can't dance at all, mate. I just jump. I tend to just jump and, and, and shout. It's embarrassing, really. <laughs> anyway, so, so this takes place in Edinburgh, which is... Uh, the university has always been very, very good, mm-hmm. and uh, it was a centre of excellence for teaching when it comes to anatomy and medicine. Yeah. So Edinburgh obviously was leading the way in anatomical study. Now, they operated to the Paris method, didn't they? Which yeah. meant one corpse per student. One cadaver per student. One cadaver per student. <laughs> because I think it's different. So, like, I think my friend did... Um, human anatomy and cell biology in the University of Liverpool and in the first year at least you shared the body it was like eight of you I think maybe by the end you got your own one but it was common to share stuff and I think even between groups or well all I know is that they were one day dissecting they were doing the lungs and so they cut them open and well they're already open but like to to remove the lungs to sort of see how it all works lift it out and there was just an ear behind <laughs> it and it was some of the older students had cut an ear off and just hidden it behind there and uh, and all those students got kicked out well I think quite right too because yes. I have a bit of respect for somebody who's given their body yeah. to you to to learn from that's exactly what I say to all my sexual partners <laughs> Do you want to learn from this body or what? <laughs> Have some respect from this body you're about to learn from. What are you going to learn from my body? What tightness really feels like. <laughs> that was disgusting. Yeah, I feel ill. Oh, dear. Right. So, so yeah, these, these uh, bodies would come, uh, basically, th- they were people who'd been executed. Yeah, so the, the Scottish law had changed and they said that the, the only bodies that, that could be used... Um, were um, people that had died in prison, sort of been executed, people who'd committed suicide, bodies of foundlings and orphans, which is very sad. Yeah. And there was actually executions had slowed down because they changed. What was the, the law? The It was the bloody law and the, the Judgment of uh, Death Act, I believe. So basically, they, it made it harder for them to execute people because they used to execute people for any old fucking reason. Yeah. And then it became more serious crimes. That, that So that means that they were only getting about. 60 people executed a year and if you think Edinburgh wasn't the only university to have medical students so there just wasn't enough at all this led to an increase in grave robbing and gangs of resurrection men which sounds cool doesn't it it's fucking cool <laughs> I think I'd go out with the resurrection man I bet, I bet they'd stink yeah in fact there's definitely got to be a band doesn't it the resurrection oh men. 100% so this led to an increase in grave robbing so resurrection men get together middle of the night they'd go into cemeteries and they dig up sort of graves of the the sort of recently buried 
Um, so a lot of the corpses weren't particularly fresh. So people were worried. And they were died of disease and stuff. Yeah. So they were not only were they rotting, they were in bad nick. Ugh. People started to worry about their loved ones when they, what had happened to their bodies after they died. They didn't want them to be taken by the resurrection men. So there was an increase in mort safes, which were invented to keep graves secure. So they were like cages around graves. You can still see them now. Particularly, there's a lot in Edinburgh. In very old graveyards, you will see... Are you laughing at me? No, I'm laughing at... I found the Resurrection Men's uh, band camp page and the first sentence is made. It made me laugh. What was it? Resurrection Men, lowly servants to the majesty of rock. <laughs> that would be cringe. Dear me. So there's sort of cages around the graves. that you, you can still see them in some graveyards now. There was... When I worked at the Rare Books Library, <clears throat> the Rare Bro- Books Librarian, and oh, thank you in my accent, um, there were adverts in various sort of magazines, Victorian magazines, about what safes and where you could buy them and why you should buy them. Uh, so They're like cages, weren't they? And they also yeah. had, there was a few, um, what are they called, graveyards that had... Tum- uh, tur- not turrets, like look at towers in them um, that would look like sometimes there was someone paid to sort of keep watch of the graveyard in there but generally they were like a visual deterrent as in like oh this is one with you know like people have fake cameras mm-hmm. while outside the houses they were basically like that because it was such a huge problem so we'll crack on to to the lads as we'll refer to them <laughs> William Burke, first of all. You've looked at... If you look at William Burke... Yeah, there's some uh, pictures or some, like, ink drawings. William Burke looks like a friend of the show, Will Duggan, without glasses on. <laughs> it's that little werewolfy little yeah. hair thing, isn't it? He's a hairy boy, isn't he? He's a very hairy boy. Fucking hell, he's fu- he made me laugh the other day. He put on our WhatsApp group that um, he, for some reason, uses a cutthroat razor yes. to shave with because he's, you know, like a gentleman, aspiring gentleman. And he was shaving his back hair with it and then sneezed <laughs> and sliced his back open like a fucking child. Oh, he's such an idiot. At times. I mean, that is. Re- if you're prone to sneezing, which he does in the morning, he sneezes like 30 yes. times in a row, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. Very uh, strange. It's, yeah, he's a peculiar boy, isn't he? He's great, though. Uh, he's lovely. It's his birthday. Um, 26. 26. Which is tomorrow, tomorrow for us. I'm taking him to see Bohemian Rhapsody. Sure. Yet again. <laughs> my third time viewing that film. I've heard it's fucking shit. It's fucking brilliant. It, I love it. I love it so much. I just want to be Freddie Mercury. I think that's in- incredibly depressing. He didn't. I always think his life's really tragic. Mate, he smashed through life. He had a brilliant time. No, he died prematurely. Yeah, of course he died prematurely, but he had a fucking great time. He was one of our... I mean, possibly. I've seen his teeth. He was definitely p- bullied in school. Possi- yeah, of course he was bullied. No wonder he played the piano. But he had a brilliant time. Like, he put to me... Possibly our greatest rock star. I agree. He yeah. definitely is, hands down. 100%. Well, he's not ours, is he? He's from Zanzibar. He's, he's also like one of the most high profile Asian men that's ever been. What I love as well is it's like, I love how it should teach people this is a very British thing. Our greatest rock star was actually from Zanzibar. Yeah. So, you know. Immigrants, peace. they get the job done to <laughs> quote uh, Hamilton. I love the film though. Like, take it for what it is, just watch it for what it is. It's so good, it's so entertaining. It's brilliant. I, is it one of those things, a bit like The Greatest Showman, which is terrible, and Mamma Mia, um, that people are like, oh, it's amazing, but what they're actually doing is going, aren't all these songs great? No, 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 it's not that. Like The performances are really good. There's a, some of it's really funny. There's a couple of plot holes, but forget <laughs> about them. The costumes are amazing. Yeah. Like, just enjoy it for what it is. And, of course, the songs are proper banging. But I know there's a lot of people saying, oh, it really glosses over his... Um, sexuality I don't think it does at all but bear in mind the film is a 12A <laughs> so you can't, you can't be showing Freddy smashing into 10 lads in leather hats can you <laughs> like just... which is an Enid Blyton short story I think <laughs> you know you can't show what he actually got up to it's implied you know that there's implied drug abuse as well you can't it's like a film that like I'd like to take my niece to see it she's 12 that's fine, like, that's fine for her to, to see. I think any sex in it... Like, if you're making a film about Madonna... Yeah. ...and you wanted it to be accessible to everybody, you couldn't show Madonna and half the things she, she got up to in her life. You can't no. just... There's a book for that. There Have you ever read that book? Sex? Yeah. No. It's just her, like, heavily oiled-up fanny on. Is she, does she get it all out? Yeah, yeah. Pretty sure you see her fanny in it. Ooh. Crikey. 
She's not shy, is she? <laughs> no, she's not shy. <laughs> Should we release a book? <laughs> Sex by our killer no filler. Do you know what it'd be me? It'd be me in a pair of like leggings and a jumper, but hoisted the jumper out so one tits out. It's like, come on then, get on with it, it's cold. <laughs> And me, me and friend of the show will dug and recreate in the oh, God. the smashing from behind scene that we surprised you with in Glasgow. I, d- I think you need to give some context to that because I don't think you told that on the podcast. Oh, so me and friend of the show will dug and decided when we did one of the tour shows in Glasgow. I said, right, get behind. Kiri had gone out to do something. I said, right, get behind me. She was backing him. Pretend you're doing me from behind. And, he- and there was a technical fault, so I was out there ages. <laughs> and Will was pretending to do me from behind doggy style for a good two minutes <laughs> we were fully clothed may I stress and uh, Will just went can't keep doing this much longer Rachel can't keep doing this but I was like it's already really funny when she comes in <laughs> and then when, and then when I came in I mean I, it was the saddest scene I've ever seen <laughs> honestly like both of you were avoiding eye contact and looking incredibly sad it was horrible it was like some weird like off book psychology test from the 1970s where they make twins do it <laughs> when you came in you went oh <gasps> I thought you made that noise. It was awful. <laughs> was just... You just looked really, like, sad. <laughs> like a Jack Russell that had been told off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, oh, my God, <coughs> what we need to talk about. So, William Burke, let's yeah. start with him. He was born in 1792 in Ernie, County Tyrone in Ireland. He was from quite a middle-class family. Um, he had two, obviously had two parents. He mm. had a brother called Constantine, which is a great name. A very comfortable upbringing. Uh, both him and Constantine were in the army as teenagers, and they served in something called the Donegal Militia. It sounds like shit rappers. Donegal Militia. <laughs> oh yeah, it does sound like a rap group, doesn't it? I've got. Uh, I can't stand. Um, like, so there's a rapper in Manchester called Bugsy Malone. I saw his advert in Euston the other day. I think he's massively famous. He's huge. He's got huge. But I just can't get on board with it. But you because know, when something's local to you, it feels shit. It's like, so, you know, like, we have loads of friends who are on TV. When you see someone you know on telly, don't you think it cheapens it? You go, <laughs> no, I don't. so on the fucking telly. Really? Yeah, what are they doing in this? No, I don't think it, I think it's nice. Cheapens it. I don't know, I think, yeah, it's great to see it, but you feel, I think, I get that thing of, like, that's weird, that's, yeah. I find it hard to watch. I think I'm it like, depends what it is. Yeah, that's true. But, like, I mean things like particularly... If it was, like, who do you think you are, I'd be like, get them off. Yeah. Get someone proper th- on. Like, things like that. But not, not like, things within comedy. Yeah. But when you see someone you know pop up in something like... For example, I've got an old friend called Sam, who's an actor, and I went to the cinema to watch The Wolfman. Right. <laughs> and he was in it. I was like, what's he fucking doing <laughs> in this? He's ruined this now. Yeah, I can't thanks do- for pretending. Sam. Yeah, he's ruined everything now. <laughs> so that kind of thing. But... There's just something about his Bugsy Malone. Like, I heard him rap it. Like, me and my mate Danny find it really funny. Because, like, you know, you hear American rappers like, yeah, ooh, West Coast and all, East Coast and all this. He's always like, yeah, 0161, I got the bus down <laughs> Berry New Road. <laughs> I'm having problems with the DVLA. <laughs> they took my car away. I'm like, mate, <laughs> it's shit. <laughs> it's just crap. I just don't, there's just something about it that I don't, I can't get on board with because it's too local to me. But won't that sound really exotic to people in America? I don't know, would it? He's from near me, Bugsy Malone. He's from near us. Wrapped about Harper Market. (laughs) It's Thursday, it's the flea market day. (laughs) Bought one shoe. (laughs) I was round the back of Asda. (laughs) It's fucking crap. It's rubbish. Bugsy Malone. I also don't like his name, Bugsy Malone. Pick something a bit more... Well, that isn't a famous yeah, that child isn't a, gangster. Yeah, a thing already. Like, I mean, now he's not listening to this. I don't think this is his thing. <laughs> um, I don't know. What would your uh, rapper... I, I think if I was a rapper... We'd I'd, come up with our rap names, haven't we? I'd have... Um, I'd call myself Petite Ice. And I'd be Little Tights <laughs> I'm I'm getting that on a T-shirt. You're going to get... <laughs> Definitely. Lil Tight Snatch, L I L apostrophe. Oh, yeah, you've got to have the apostrophe in there. Yeah. Because it'd be like, yeah, just not like Lil. <laughs> yeah. Or someone's anti. <laughs> Lil Tight Snatch. <laughs> Here she is, Lil Tight Snatch. <laughs> so, he got he got married. <laughs> Drunk herself to death at 42. <laughs> it's me, isn't it? <laughs> So he got, he got married. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still laughing. I sound like someone's auntie. Lil. <laughs> <laughs> he 
got married, it didn't last very long. It was a very common problem that we all have. He had an argument with his father-in-law over land ownership. <laughs> and he deserted his wife and his family. He had two children. He moved to Scotland, William Burke did. That's who we're still on. To work as a labourer on the Union Canal. Now, the Union Canal was a huge project, and you can read about it, as I tried to, but it's utterly fucking boring, and it has no place in this podcast. But there was a, basically there was a huge influx of sort of immigration, wasn't there? Yeah. Because they needed so many workers to make the Union Canal happen. Yeah. Now, he lived in a place... He moved to Madiston, which is near Falkirk, and he met a woman called Helen McDougall while he was working on the Union Canal. He had the little nickname for her. He used to call her Nelly. I think that's cute. nice, isn't it? Yeah, we asked people if there were any um, nicknames in the in the audience, and oh. we would ask that. And there were two gay guys on, on the New York date who were great. They were and, great, yeah. And uh, he was like, "I call my partner Sugar Cookie," and Sugar Cookie was clearly fucked off that he told everyone. And we were like, "What do you call him?" And he was like, "Fuck face." <laughs> it's great. I uh, I used to call my favorite ex boyfriend. We never called each other by our first names. We used to call our, we used to call each other pencil. All the time. I think that's very cute. Because once I was speaking to him on Skype and he was drunk because he was in America and I wasn't. And I was getting ready to go to work and I said, what's wrong with you? You look really pensive. And he went, yeah, you're a pencil. And uh, it just stuck. And that's what we used to call each other in public as well. People like, these two are weird. <laughs> I think it's really nice. It's cute, isn't it? Yeah, I don't have anything like that. Oh, well, my partner and I call each other, what, pig. It's our, like, term of endearment. And in my phone, he's just saved as the pig emoji. <laughs> <laughs> Which is actually quite hard to find him in a, fur- a hurry if you're trying to search for something. <laughs> uh, Will Duggan and I, friend of the show, Will Duggan, we call each other, I call him uh, Honeybee, and he calls me Queen Bee. That's very cute. That's quite nice, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. really nice. There's nothing in it. We'll see, mate. No. We'll see. No. If you get some wasting disease, he'll be the one who takes care of you. <laughs> He's going to have to. <laughs> I mean, it's not the same for me. He can just go back to his parents. So when the canal was finished... <laughs> Uh, he moved to a place called Tanner's Close, which is still there in Edinburgh. It's Just off the Royal Mile, if you're familiar mm-hmm. with the um, geography of Edinburgh. This was in 1827. He had different jobs. He, he sold second-hand clothes to poor locals. It was a vintage shop, basically. <laughs> he was a cobbler, of which he was quite successful. He earned upwards of a pound a week doing that. He was described as industrious, good-humoured, and he often entertained his clients by singing and dancing on their doorstep. Which sounds like a fucking legitimate nightmare. <laughs> if someone was like, hey, that Irish cobbler who sings and dances uh, on your doorstep, I'd be like, go and fetch the fucking hose. Well, you know how I feel about singing and dancing. Lush. That's all I've got to say uh, to you. I went to who... Um, <laughs> I was on the phone to Rachel. We don't normally talk to each other on the phone, No, we don't, do we? we don't, we don't. It's we don't. constant WhatsApps. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> And uh, she was like, hold on, I'm just going to nip into Lush so we're chatting. And then she was like, hiya, you know, as they could say hello as you walk in. And then so she walks in and uh, and then she goes, oh, fuck this fucking shit. <laughs> and then uh, I was like, what's happened? And she went, she went in there and they're all dancing because it's a Friday. Oh, embarrassing. Um, just, just don't, like, you might be near the West. It was Oxford Circus. You might be near the West and you're not going to get discovered where you're they're selling not fucking doing it bath to, they're not, Of course they no, are. No, they're not. Of course they are. D- look, don't underestimate the arrogance of youth. Of course <laughs> they are. That's exactly why they're doing it. <laughs> so, he was a Presbyterian as well. Apparently he was seldom seen without a Bible. God, he sounds like a right left, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. Which brings us to William Hare. Presbyterian sounds like you, um, you know, when you still eat fish but nothing else. <laughs> That's what I, uh, I always think when I think of Presbyterian, I think of that. And... Um, my partner's... Is that going to pick up? Oh, yeah, I should stop doing it, shouldn't I? <laughs> I can't help it, it's really satisfying. I'm writing in dust with my finger on the on the windowsill. Like someone who's in a, been imprisoned in the Tower of London. Yeah, I feel like Redfield, <laughs> yeah. you know, eating all the dead flies off the window. Um, he, uh, <laughs> I explained to my partner's brother that we were uh, tedious vegans because he hadn't told him. And then he was recounting the story to his partner but couldn't remember the phrase that I used... So he said, um, oh, they're, um, they're, they're pesky vegans. And she was like, does that mean they still eat fish? <laughs> she's really bright. She's an accountant. She's so, so clever. Um, but there's been the odd flourish where she sort of uh, exhibited a lack of common sense. There's this great story about how she was... Um, have I told this before about the fondue? No, you told it on the live show. 
Um, so she was, they were all eating fondue and uh, so like dipping it in and having it. And uh, she was like, oh God, it's great, isn't it? It's sauce is a bit boozy though and everyone just sort of ignored it and carried on and she was like yeah I think I, I don't think I'm gonna have any more of the sauce it's, it's a bit boozy and they're like there is no sauce and then they realized that she had been dipping the stuff into the liquid paraffin that was on fire underneath the fondue good god Ooh, a bit boozy oh yeah she thinks so mate it's fucking dinosaurs <laughs> so fucking dangerous oh Kath from Games with the funniest thing the other day she was talking about how much she hates the smell of petrol and then I was talking about how petrols fossils and dinosaurs basically and she was like is that why it stinks like that's the smell of the <laughs> dead just... bodies <laughs> it's why it stinks oh made me laugh oh god right William Hare oh shit yeah he was probably a bit vague this he was probably born in County Armagh or County Londonderry or Newry in Northern Ireland um, his age and year of birth are unknown bit of a diva a <laughs> uh, bit like me never tell anyone my age I don't I like your attitude as you like it doesn't matter how no. old I am well it's like when I think you know when you get asked to be in like to, someone wants to write something about you and they ask your age you're like what does it fucking matter there's no reason to put Rachel Fairburn, however old, da da da. I don't, I just think it's unnecessary. I think you look great for 48. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> I mean, I, to be honest, I could be any age between 12 and 70. <laughs> and I just don't think anyone would question it. Like, I could say, oh, it's my 12th birthday last week. And they'd go, oh, you're very mature for 12. I'd be like, yeah, thank you very much. I'd say, it's my 50th next week. And people would go, looking good. <laughs> I just think it could be any age. A taxi driver guessed my age the other day as 10 years younger than I am. Oh, really? Mm. As I say, my only worry now is every time I get asked out by a bloke and I find out how old they are, I'm like, fuck. Yeah, you I'm do. always 10 years older. Yeah, there's, you like catnip to very young men, aren't you? Yeah. They love it. Would invite you over and, don't know, what do young people do? What, what, what do you want to do, invite me over and... I, Fidget spin? Do they, th- do they think I can cook? Is that what it is? Is <laughs> that what they think? So you can do the washing? Yeah. Oh, God. Anyway, so, he was arrested in 1828 and he gave his age as, as 21. So, the work, we'll work with that. If you're that bothered, you can do some maths. Now, <laughs> he was... <laughs> he worked in Ireland. When he was in Ireland, he was an agricultural labourer. Sort of a very similar background uh, to Burke, actually. He moved to Scotland as well to work on the Union Canal. He moved to Edinburgh after it had finished to become a Coleman's assistant. And he actually lodged at Tanner's Close as well. With uh, He lived with a chap whose name was Logue and Logue's wife, Margaret. Logue's a fucking cool name. Yeah, Logue died in 1826 and they think that Hare then married Margaret. Moved in very quickly. He was described as... Illiterate and uncouth, lean, quarrelsome, violent, of a, mo- a moral character. He had scars and old wounds about his head and his brow. Basically, it translates as, I probably would have tried to get off of him. <laughs> That's what would have happened. Margaret was dis- described as a hard-featured debaucherer. Yeah, they, sound, they sound fucking great, don't they? Yeah, they sound like a right laugh. Now, in 1827, Burke and his wife... Uh, went to Midlothian to work on the harvest, and this is where they met Hare, uh, and they, they all became friends together. And they all moved in to Tanner's Close, the two couples, and they got big reputations for being hard drinking, and uh, they had really, like, and, for, and for the boisterous behaviour, bunch of legends. 29th of November, 1827, they also had lodgers um, in the place that they were living, uh, in Hare's. It was Hare's house they were living in. Now, it was a lodger called Donald that they had, and this is 29th of November, 1827, he died of something called dropsy. Which I googled. Oh. Don't do it. See, I always do this. I always, when I'm looking up a disease, I go into Google Images and search there first. Don't. It's oh. fucking horrific. And I don't know how you can die of it, because it's, it's a horrible disease. Um, so basically, dropsy is like, it looks like fluid that sits under the skin. So like, you're like, everything comes hugely inflamed. Well, not inflamed, but like, just full of fluid and you like press it and then the, it doesn't Ugh. bounce back again it's horrible but I don't know how you get to the point where you die of it but it looks fucking appalling well to me it drops it <clears throat> sounds like something a very very middle class mother who drinks every single day would say after she dropped the baby <laughs> for the 15 to drops it <laughs> oh drops it that would be, be me if I was middle class <clears throat> now oh, I had children 
Uh, <clears throat> now, Donald um, owed rent. Now, and he died before he received his pension from the army, and he owed four pounds. So Hare had moaned to Burke about this. He complained. He said, oh, he's died. He owes me all this money. They decided what they would do to make that money back. They thought, well, we'll just sell his body to the medical students. Now, the local parish <clears throat> paid for Donald's funeral. And when the carpenter had come and made the coffin, they removed the body and they hid it under the bed and they filled it with bark and resealed it. Uh, they took the corpse. I mean, it, please don't show me dropsy. That's awful. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was showing a Google image. It's fucking terrifying. Ugh. Poor fucker. Ugh. This sounds like a very, very dark Chuckle Brothers <laughs> um, sort of incident, doesn't it? Yeah. So they took the corpse to the university and they sold it. Now, they were told when they went to the university, ask for Professor Munro. They asked for Professor Munro and they were directed to Dr Knox's premises in Surgeon Square. They sold the body for £7.10. shillings. Hare received £4.05 shillings and Burke got £3.05. Shillings. Hare got more to cover the unpaid rent from the, the deceased. And uh, what Dr Knox said, he didn't ask where the body had come from, he asked no questions. He said, I'd be glad to see them again when they have another body to dispose of. Yes, and he advised them to always come back after dark and there would be no questions asked. Basically, they sat down and they did some sums and they were like, right, well, grave robbing is really dirty and it's very hard work. Mm -hmm. And once you dig it up, there's no guarantee it's going to be fresh or it's going to, if it is fresh, it's not been, you know, damaged Mm -hmm. or what they died of. You know, they might be in horrible condition. But if we murder them, we know exactly what condition they're going to be in. So let's just do that. And they just sort of, like, worked out that that was the best way to do it. Well, the first actual victim, because obviously the first one wasn't a murder, the first one was uh, Joseph Miller, who lived at at the house with them, another lodger. He got a fever and he became delirious and they decided to suffocate him. Now, they had a method that they used to do. It was called Birkin. So... They would hold, was it the nose and the mouth? Yes. So what they would do is one would hold the nose, um, one would sit on the chest to try and get all the air out and hold uh, the mouth and the other one would, uh, like, to stop them from struggling, hold their arms and hold the nose and they would basically suffocate them that way and it was a way of killing them um, so the body wasn't damaged and it worked and, you know, like so they're in really good condition. Well, they say that that method that they had... At the time, it would have been practically undetectable. It, you'd be able to detect it now. With Only forensics. with very modern, modern forensics. Yeah. But, yeah. But pretty much then, it would just have been a normal death, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um. They would. They gave. They, they said that they decided to kill Joseph Miller because um he was. They were worried. Hare and his wife were worried they were going to get an infection off him because he was poorly. Bullshit. Doesn't stop. That doesn't stop him covering his mouth uh, and yeah. sitting on his <laughs> chest and getting right near to him, does it? So they gave him whiskey which they did with every victim, as we'll find out, get them a bit drunk, and then they do a bit of burking. They got £10 off Knox for this body. Um, now... Fair or whack that, isn't it? Yeah, it's not bad. Considering when he was a cobbler, he was on a pound a week, and that was considered good money. Yep. The next... They moved quite very quickly, so the next one was uh, just an English man from Cheshire. who was selling matches. Meant plenty of those I want to kill. Yeah, didn't they say, didn't they say that... He, he turned up at their house and he had jaundice. He got jaundice. This house. I was going to say, why is everyone fucking ill? <laughs> it's like, you know, it reminds me of, you know, that episode of The Young Ones, Sick, where they're all in bed. Ah. <laughs> it reminds me of that. It's, Absolutely disgusting. But then, then that must have been at the time then that everyone... Because if you think about, like, every time in your life you've had something, imagine there was no health service Ugh. and no pain... Like, you would just be living with all those things. Ugh. And just dying. Of- yeah, and you'd have a broken leg that wasn't set right Ugh. and, you know, all that stuff. Depressing, isn't it? It's fucking horrible. Um, God bless the NHS, let's keep fighting for it. <laughs> Abigail Simpson was the next victim. She was invited to Hare's house and she was plied with alcohol. So got her a bit drunk and then they murdered her. They put the body in a tea chest, took it to Dr Knox, he didn't ask any questions and gave them £10 of, for her body and he approved of its freshness. But Yep. Between February and March, there's no definite dates for these, between February and March... There was an old woman invited uh, around to the house by Margaret Hare, which is interesting. Yeah, she was definitely in on it. She definitely knew. She was given whiskey. 
hair, this is horrible, hair then covered her mouth and nose with a mattress cover. And she was dead by the evening. That's another £10. This is an interesting one. Mary Patterson and Janet Brown, this was April of the following year. They were sex workers. Um, now, they, where did they met them? Was it So basically they were out in a bar drinking and they met these two sex workers, started having a laugh with them. And then we're like, why don't you come back to ours? Got loads of whiskey. So, so they went back and uh, started starting on the old whiskey. Mary gets absolutely hammered and goes to sleep off the booze. And then an argument breaks out between Janet and the the fellas. So mm-hmm. Janet fucks off and says, "I'm going to come back for Mary," and goes over to her old landlady's house, Mrs. Laurie. And um, so tells Miss Laurie the stories. I've been out drinking with these guys. I've, I've left Mary there, and the landlady is like. Don't leave her on her own with two strange men in some weird boarding house where everyone's dead or dying. <laughs> so she sends Janet back to the house with the servant. So they knock on the door and um, they get told, oh no, Burke's gone out with Mary. I don't know what time he'll be back. And Janet goes, fine, I'll sit and wait for them then. So she sits there and waits for a bit and then she tells the servant of Miss Laurie, go back and tell Miss Laurie what's going on. So the servant goes back and goes, oh, Miss Laurie, she's waiting for Mary to come back because she's out with work at the moment. She told me to come back. Miss Laurie's like, what the fuck? Did you leave her on her own? And then this poor servant is sent back again. Oh, you'd just be like, fuck off. Yeah, you? and I haven't even got my pedometer with me today. <laughs> so sends her back, gets Janet, tells her to leave. Now, what they found out later on is that Mary was already dead when Janet came back and knocked on the door. They'd already burked her mm-hmm. um, and was in, in the house, basically. Well, they take the body to Dr Knox and they say, oh, she drank herself to death. And this is where it's quite interesting because one of the assistants, when he saw her body, he was like, hang on a minute, I recognise this woman. Wasn't she still warm as well? Yes, she was still warm. Um, and he said, oh, I recognise this woman. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, he said, they said, oh, we just bought her off an old woman in Canongate. She's not a potato. <laughs> She's a fucking woman. Why, how, would you, how would you buy... That makes me shudder as well, because when you think of Canongate, is that down where Cow, Cowsgate as well? Yeah, yeah, that's the... Which where is the, where all the free fringes so Yeah. like... Late night sketch comedy or like <laughs> improv troupe or like one woman show about breaking down in the desert. Oh, God. The amount of shows I have to avoid every year at Edinburgh because someone starts speaking to me in a bar and then they relentlessly go, can you come watch my show? Or, I don't know why people do that. Can I say, if you choose to come watch my show, fine. I appreciate it if you're an another act. Thank you very much. Thank you for your support. Don't fucking expect me to come watch yours. <laughs> well, I just don't like... Yeah, I also, I just know how busy everyone is up there. And like the weird thing to be like, come and see my show. But like, why? What do you think is going to happen off the back of yeah. that? I guess they're just desperate for people in the room. They just hope that you're going to tweet about it. Oh, I mean, it's not good. Yeah, of course I'll tweet about it. But I just don't like being... I don't like being railroaded into something. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I like to yeah. be... Yeah. Leave me alone, basically, is what I'm saying. So it was interesting that these students were like, I recognise this sex worker. And they were like, where from? They're like, oh, I can't remember. Actually, now you've said it. Um, so <laughs> the next f- a few victims, they were well, like... Well, we must, we must say as well, Knox apparently was delighted oh, yeah. uh, with this body... And as if he gave them eight pounds, and as we say, she was still warm. He stored it in whiskey for three months and then dissected her. That's weird, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And also, then, how cheap's fucking whiskey? That's a lot of whiskey. Everyone's it? knocking it back up, keeping a woman in it. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> Every absolutely. It was practically tradition. <laughs> um, now, I think it was hair. Burke or Hare's wife actually kept Mary Patterson's skirt and petticoat as well. That's out of order. So she knew. She Doing a Rose West. Categorically new. And the interesting part, you'll notice that they get paid different amounts for the bodies, even though he's like, oh, she's great, I'm going to keep her in whiskey. And it's because it was depending on what time of the year it is. And so basically, if it was winter, I think they'd get more mm-hmm. because they could use the body for longer because it was colder. Because basically you'd keep using it until it got too decomposed to dissect, which is fucking rum. Blech. So, yeah, if it was warmer, they couldn't use them for as long as so they got less for them. Well, didn't... Um, someone came back to try and find her, didn't they? Yes. Um, this lady came back... Well, who was it? Was it her friend? One of her fr- Yeah, one of her friends came back to try and find her. And she was told that she'd left for Glasgow with a travelling salesman. <laughs> which is... Uh, I love it. Yeah, interesting. That's what I now say when I'm on the rag. <laughs> 
I am leaving for Glasgow with a travelling salesman. For about five days, <laughs> so I don't even bother trying to talk to me. Now, the next victim, Mrs Haldane, who was described as a stout old woman. Now, it just shows this poor woman has been dead for over 100 years and she's still being body shamed. Disgusting. Yep. She lodged with them and she... Rumours that she was a sex worker as well. Mm-hmm. She'd got drunk, they'd given given a drink and she fell asleep in the, the stable, legend. She was <laughs> smothered and she was sold to Knox, as, as is standard, as we learn. Now, some months later, her daughter Peggy went to try and find her mum. Yes. She managed to track her down, like that. she'd asked people if they'd seen her and that was the last place she was seen. She went to see them and what happens? They kill Peggy as well. It's awful. Yeah, it's horrible. It's getting all a bit too close to home though, isn't it? Yes, especially with this next one. Yeah. So um, they're getting a bit lazy and a bit complacent. So Anna McDougall, who is a relative of Nellie's, um, she, I think she's... Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, so she's Helen's um, relative... They murder her. Now, Burke, who's kind of related to this woman, is happy to kill her, but he said, I am i don't want to actually do it. Like, we can sell her, but I don't want to do it. So Hare murders her on his own. But, like, that's so close to home. I mean, yeah, like you say, literally. Yeah. But they just they just don't give a shit by this time. They're getting away with so many of them. But they're trying to pick these... From now on, they're like, let's try and pick people that people don't recognise. Um, and they fuck up massively with yeah. the next one. There was a lady called Effie who was a cinder gatherer, which is like the most Victorian job in the world, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I think I'd be a match girl, you know. Do you? Yeah, you know, like a little match girl. I'd be found frozen to death outside a train station or something. Oh, I think I'd be a big titted sex worker. Do you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I'd be like one of the only fat fat Victorians you'd see. I, I've got the, I wouldn't have the luxury of being able to be big titted. <laughs> you'd be like, oh, can you work in the kitchen with the other lads, please? Thanks very much. Um, you'd be up a chimney, mate. I would be up a chimney, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so Effie is in the gatherer. She was dr- in the street and she was drunk. And Burke saw her. Now, she was so drunk that a policeman was asking her where she was going because she was so drunk. He was like, we need to find out where this woman is, is going just to make sure she's she gets home okay he didn't do his job very well because Burke steps in and says oh I know this woman um, oh yeah she's uh, didn't he say he was his cousin or something yeah. he said he was related to her and she was so drunk that he managed to get her in, as if he was going to take her home and look after her and he killed her as well and they got £10 for her body basically that is what's known as a cunch trick isn't it's it Peter Curtin did something it's disgusting absolutely disgusting and um, there's another. This is horrible. I mean, they're all horrible, but this one's particularly horrible. There was an old woman and her grandson who uh, came to lodge with them. Now, the old lady, they gave her a load of painkillers. Sort yeah. of drugged her while she was sitting near the fire, wasn't she? She went to bed and they they murdered her. And the little boy, a grandson... He had problems, didn't he? Wasn't yeah, he... he was deaf and mute. Yeah. So he was in the kitchen... And while they were murdering his grandmother, obviously he wasn't aware of any of this, they broke his back. Yeah. Oh, and Burke Over said... his knee, he said. Horrible. This is... I mean, do you know what? It's horrible what they were doing. But that's just inhumane, that. Yeah. There is no need for that. So Burke said that this was the only one that he felt... He actually felt bad about this one. He was haunted by the boy's expression. Boo-hoo, ever so sorry. Um, they, put, they had to put the boy in a herring barrel because he was too small for the tea chest. Now, well, they both wouldn't fit in it, so that's right. In a, a barrel. Uh, now, Hare's horse is one of the only characters in this with a conscience. <laughs> so the horse, they attach the cart to him to, or her, to go to the grass market and to, to go to Doctor Knox's house. And the horse wouldn't go further than grass market. It was like, I'm out of this, mate. Yeah. I'm, you're out of order. Yeah. Nay more. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> I'm trying. Just tell the hoof now. What? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> that was a bit laboured, that one. Yeah, that was a bit laboured, <laughs> wasn't it? I'm having an absolute mare with this. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. When you're in court, you'll be the main attraction. Jesus Christ. Anyway, no, the, the poor thing never got to say any of these jokes because <laughs> <laughs> Hair got so angry with him 
the horse that he shot him. Yeah, he just shot him. Now, I'm not laughing at that because it's not, I mean, it's not funny. What I am laughing at is every time when we did this in America, like people had listened to the story and as soon as we said they shot the horse, people went, <gasps> oh! <laughs> like that was the first time that anyone was ever upset by anything. I mean, let's face it though, the horse has had ample opportunity to say, to, you know, stop, but it's only on this yeah. one. He knows what's going on. Absolutely. Fucking why weren't you calling crime stoppers? Probably Red Rum's grandfather. <laughs> 24th of June. That was a niche. It was. It really was. Uh, Red Rum is known as the greatest racehorse in British racing history. And also, if you spell its name backwards, it's murder. Murder. 24th of June. Actually, technically a very clever joke. 24th of June. Oh, yeah, now in retrospect, you figured out it is. <laughs> um, Burke and MacDougall went to Falkirk to visit her father, and there was a bit of an argument because... <laughs> He, Bert came back and he said that he thought that Hare was selling bodies without him. Yeah, so it was like, where have you been? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, uh, nowhere. And he's like, you're lying. <laughs> I can smell it on you. That's a bit like when you've got a mate and you introduce them to another friend and they know each other through you and then you find out they've been hanging out without you. See, you've got a real issue with this. I think that's fine. <laughs> you were fuming that there was a couple of people at our live shows that were doing just that. I don't know, I just... Uh, you know what, be honest about it. It's when you find out after the event and you go, oh yeah, been to Nando's together, have you? <laughs> you fucking pieces of shit. You know, <laughs> you know I'm a carnivore. <laughs> why, where was my invite? It's that kind of thing. I don't And like you wonder it. why you don't get invited to stuff, mate. I get very sort of territorial over friendships, me. <laughs> I'm very like, oh yeah, they're my friend. <laughs> I mean, it's got me into a lot of trouble in the past, but we'll, uh, we'll move on from that. Next, <laughs> next victim, Daft Jamer. <laughs> James Wilson. So he was sort of a, not a celebrity, but he was very well known in Edinburgh. So he was a guy with uh, quite a low IQ, really big lad. He was like 16 mm-hmm. years old, ginger hair. He had a, I think, a club foot. Um, and he used to knock around the grass market and sort of help the traders out. Um, the grass market is an area of town in Edinburgh, by the way, but it is it was originally just a large mm-hmm. market. So he used to knock around there, help the traders. He was also sort of a a casual babysitter because the kids used to love him so he would sort of entertain them and make sure that they were safe and you know so they people could dump their kids yeah so he was like a well-liked local really well loved yeah yeah um so they killed him now he's one of the only ones that they didn't get drunk because he didn't drink so um and it must have been a struggle because he was a really big strong lad and he wasn't hammered so yeah it must have been one of the more physical murders that they did. So they murdered him, took him to Dr Knox, and um, the students were like, isn't that Daft Jamie, which is what he was known as? Um, and Daft is like, uh, it's kind of a, it's not a very PC term, but it's not a spiteful necessarily, no, is it? No, so... Someone's Daft, they're just, it's like silly, isn't it? Like, yeah, stop being Daft. Yeah, but also if some of the go like, oh, the Daft lad in the village would be someone with like learning yeah. difficulties, yeah. So they were like, isn't that Daft Jamie? And he was like, no. And they're like, I'm pretty sure it is. Look at his foot and stuff. And then the next time they saw the body, he'd removed the feet, the hands and the head. <sighs> so I was like, no, this is just one of those headless, armless, uh, headless, handless, feetless bodies that you see mm. so much of. And so, yeah, that was, again, I think Robert Knox being culpable and mm-hmm. uh, hiding. Yeah. Yeah, basically hiding what he's up to. So, yeah, so James and Anne Gray move in with the Burks. So they live there. Now, one day they're there and this woman comes over called Mary Doherty to get pissed. So she met Burke that morning and and Burke said, um, this is Halloween, 1828. He said, oh, our mothers were related, which just feels like something (laughs) you could only kind of get away with at that time. So they're getting pissed right up until the night. They're dancing, they're drinking... Um, now the greys go away for a couple of days and they sort of leave this scene and apparently the neighbour said that they were getting hammered and and sort of like drinking and dancing through the night and at one point one of the neighbours Hugh Alston hears someone shouting murder through the wall so he runs out in the street to find a policeman um, can't find one shocking (laughs) Um, goes back to the flat it's gone completely quiet so he's like well case closed I guess nothing untoward has happened but, of course, Mary Doherty was murdered mm-hmm. in that time. So the Greys come back and uh, they go, where's Margaret? And uh, <laughs> Mary says, oh, 
she came on to book, so we had to kick her out because she was uh, she was coming on to. Oh yeah, that was a woman's fault, isn't it? Eh? Yeah. So they say all that, and they're like, "God, wow, well, good, good job, she's gone." Now, what they don't know is that Ma- Margaret's body is stored underneath the spare bed Ugh. under a load of straw. So um, Anne's stockings are drying in the spare room, so she's like, oh, "I'm just gonna go and grab my st- stockings." And uh, Mary's like, no, you're fucking not. No, you're not going in there. And she's like, well, I can't go in the spare room. She's like, no reason. You just definitely can't go on. She's like, why is she being so defensive? We're having to clear out. Yeah, so not Mary, sorry. So this is Helen. So then Helen leaves later that night to go out and get something. And as soon as she leaves, they obviously go into the spare room and they obviously find the body. Now, mm. they go to the police and on the way they bump into Helen and goes, we found that fucking body, you've been murdering people. And she's like, listen, I will pay you £10 a week not to say anything to anyone. And thankfully, they don't take it, because they definitely would have been murdered. Yeah. That's a lot of fucking money. They'd either have been murdered or ended up hanged. Yeah. So either way, it wasn't going to work out very well for them. No. And also, £10 a week... That means that they would have just carried on and carried on and carried on, wouldn't they? Absolutely. And there's absolutely no way Burke or Hare would let them, would let her pay them that. No, no, no. They would have murdered. Yeah. Um, so they refused and they went to the police. So in that meantime, Helen fucking runs home. Um, the police go over to the house. Margaret's body's gone. It's gone. So Burke and Helen are questioned separately. They have completely different stories. Now, at the same time... The police get an anonymous tip-off about Dr. Robert Knox and people turning up that people recognise in his mm-hmm. lab. Is that what you call it? Surgery. Surgery? Yeah. So they go up to the university and they find Mary Doherty and James Wilson in there. So they find the bodies of Mary Doherty, who's just been murdered, and what is left of Jamie Wilson. So, Hare's arrested. Um, Now, Burke blames Hare, says, I didn't know any of this was going on. I had no idea. I know I live with him, we're friends, but I had no idea. So, a month goes by, and they can't move anything forward because no one's testifying against anyone. They're all sort of lying, covering their backs. There's also a thing in the law that you couldn't uh, couldn't force someone to testify against your husband or wife. Right, yeah. Um, So, uh, a month goes by, and the police go, right, we need to fucking do something. So, they offer Hare immunity to testify against Burke. So, Burke is charged with Mary Doherty, James Wilson and Mary Patterson's murders, based on evidence found in uh, Robert Knox's place mm-hmm. and bits around the house. Um, now, they don't fuck around with this. Oh, no. They had, the trial is on Christmas Eve Ugh. of 1828. Imagine as if, that. As if you've not got enough to do. Yeah. Imagine all the peeling you'd have to do when you get home. <laughs> and trying to hold that down when you've just listened to this trial. Oh. Both of the hares testify against the Burks. I know. Scandal there. Mm. And uh, and then Christmas morning, again, they fucking carry on with it. It takes the jury 50 minutes um, to decide. Of course it is. They want to get home and fucking watch Sound of Music (laughs) to find Burke guilty. Now, Helen is let free Mm -hmm. after a while. And he, 16 months before he's hanged, he confesses to everything, which is why we know so much mm-hmm. about the crimes. Well, Hare actually was put away for a bit, but he was released in February 1829, wasn't it? Yes. So he did a little bit of time for it, but not as much no. as he should have done. But what happens is when he got released, there's fucking mob rule. Yep. So he gets found and battered. The rumour is he's thrown into a lime pit, which makes him go blind. Yep. And he is uh, was last... Uh, well, he was seen in Carlisle... And also there was a rumour that was a blind beggar in London um, that was him. Mm-hmm. Helen couldn't escape either, could she? No, she eventually... She was sort of harangued by people and moved to Australia eventually. Uh, Margaret, she went back to Ireland because they were both just mobbed wherever they went. Yeah. Um, now, obviously they hanged Burke, but he didn't just stop there. They sort of made a bit of an example of him. They used his skin to do a bit of anthropodermic bibliopedia which is where you use human skin to cover books. Uh, so very popular during the French Revolution. Uh, the library that I used to work at, there were several books that were leather-bound, and some of them probably would have been uh, human skin, but you weren't, you weren't allowed to know which ones. So, because you didn't want to make it a thing. Right. Because people are weird. Yeah, people are weird. Says us. <laughs> and, uh, Thanks for listening. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> now, they also made a, car- a business card case in his skin. <laughs> They, his skeleton is still on display in Edinburgh Medical School, 
And you can see the book and the card holder. Surgeon's, Surgeon's Hall. Hall in Edinburgh as well. Yeah, there's loads of stuff you can see. Who did his autopsy when he died? Oh, strapping Dr Knox, who gets away with everything. Pretty much, yeah. He gets disfellowed, doesn't he? So he's a yeah. fellow of the university. So he's, that's all that, was, that happened to him. Because in 1856, he was working uh, in the pathological um, section of Brompton uh, Cancer Hospital. Yeah. And he was last practising at Hackney Medical Practice and he died in 1862. Yeah, I can't So he totally it. gets away so with it. So he's down in Hackney, yeah. And he, he yeah, they, there was pressure locally. Down in Hackney, for... he's a fucking hipster as well. He don't get any worse than that, does <laughs> ah, he? was a, um, yeah, he was forced to step down. But he still kept practising. He's like, we said this, to me. He's like Louis C.K. Just yeah. disappears <laughs> for ten months and then comes back like nothing happened. But everybody knew that he was a part of it. There was a children's song that used to go... Up the close and down the stair, in the house with Burke and Hare. Burke's the butcher, Hare's the thief, knocks the man who buys the beef. Oof. So that was a song that people used to sing in Edinburgh. Even the kids There's no do candle that. in the wind, is it? No, it's, it's all right. <laughs> um, but because of this case, the law changed um, to protect people, that you, to try and discourage people from murdering for money. So they changed it that um, the bodies could be uh, given to medical science if they were from... They were unclaimed bodies from poor families, mm. basically. Um, and, well, they were unclaimed bodies, which meant that it was almost always poor people that wouldn't come forward and collect them because they couldn't afford to bury them. So that was just another way of, again, just poor people. It's just depressing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and it all feels like it would be so filthy and cold. I know. Well, do you know what? It's very cold today, isn't it? Yeah. And my feet are freezing. And it's We're sat under a duvet. Doing, doing this, this is making me feel colder. Yeah, like, I'm just, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Because Edinburgh's always... Uh, Edinburgh at this time of year would be absolutely freezing as yeah. well. And that just, like, drafty houses. No yeah. one can get fucked on whiskey all the time. <laughs> um, so that is... It's usually vodka hair. that gets me fucked, mate. <laughs> really? <laughs> are you a vodka person? No, I was doing a sex joke. Uh... I do actually drink. To be honest with you, I'll drink any spirit. <laughs> Thanks for the sex joke. Thanks for having to explain, actually. Um, it is cold. I think my, after, I think after the horse jokes, I think <laughs> that's beaked. gone. Yeah, my mind's just slowly slowing down. Thanks so much for listening. Yeah, we really you. appreciate it. Uh, we're very excited to see you guys at the Christmas shows mm-hmm. in the next couple of weeks. Um, don't forget to bring sanitary products. Menstrual products. Is that what you call them? Yeah. Why? Because sanitary is... Makes it sound like it's... Unclean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, jam rags, as jam you rags, like to say. Yeah. Just bring them to the live shows for yeah, the collection. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. We, mm-hmm. we made a really big difference. Um, someone said, very sweet... I must like, stress it's not for my vagina and everything it went through in America, this. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's nothing to do with me, I'm fine. We're going to have the last bugle playing for that at the beginning of the show. <laughs> <laughs> to remember Rachel's fanny. Um, yeah, if you can bring them to the Sofferture or we'll go to Every Month Manchester, a brilliant organisation. And then in London, I think we're going to do it to, is it, are they called like Bloody Good Period? I think so. But yeah, yeah they're an organisation down there. Some very, very sweet people have been saying, because I'm, oh yeah, I'm on tour next year. It would be great to see you guys there. Obviously, no pressure, but I'm going fucking nearly everywhere. Um, so, and some of them have already sold out. Bristol sold out, Cardiff sold out. Um, a Bristol with sold out. First Manchester Day is sold out. There's a second Manchester Day. It'd be great to see you there. Um, uh, yeah, so someone was like, are you going to be collecting them at your solo shows? But like, what you need to understand is like, I'm travelling usually on my yeah. own on a train <laughs> and it's usually like at least a bin bag's full like of tampons. Yeah, you I, can't. Just, I can't be lugging that around the country. There are There will be food banks near you that really need it. So um, yeah, feel free to donate to your local one. Uh, so yeah, your tour. People yeah. can buy tickets for that. Yes. Thanks to people who came to my show at the Frog and Bucket. Sold it the fuck out, mate. Yeah. And I'm doing it again, against my better judgment. Because to yeah. me, once something's done, it's done, isn't it? It is. Uh, I'm in a great mood today. <laughs> like, that's right. Fuck it, it's done. What am I going to talk about next? Mm-hmm. I want to be Freddie Mercury. Uh, I'm doing another one at home in Manchester again uh, that I've been asked to do. It's a, a double header. Uh, but I'm going on first, and if you want to see me, come and see me because <laughs> I don't give a shit about the other person, quite frankly. Who is it? Oh, really? Yeah. So do do what you will, but I'll be going on first. Uh, stay for the show, but I'm looking forward to doing it again. So that'll be on sale soon. I'll let you know. Uh, but other than that, great. 
It's a fucking banging show. Uh, you know, I'm not going to Edinburgh this year, so I'll be up there doing a musical and suspiciously cheap and all killer and stuff. But that'll probably be about it. And Gaines have got a new show, so I'll be focusing on that. Oh, lots going on. Lots, lots going of, on. Lots of fingers in pies, mate. Yeah. Um, Hopefully next podcast I might have some interesting stories for us. Oh, because you're going on a date? Uh, yeah, well, I'll tell them that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think next one will be a Christmas special. Christmas special. So we should put some time aside for it. I think I've got a day for us. But why don't we do the Golden State Killer and do a three-parter? Let's do that, yeah. Yeah. Um, That'll cheer us up. Or maybe you're, all, well, maybe you're all fatigued because everyone kind of jumped on it in a kind of a gross yeah, way. Yeah, maybe um, fed up of it. Yeah, so... You know, we're always open to suggestions. Um, thank you so much for listening. Thank You're you. brilliant. Hope to see you on tour, and we'll see a load of you in the next couple of weeks. Bye! Bye.